Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to be here again. Uh, thank you, Pastor Dennis. Thank you for letting me speak to these fine people today. It's a, it's a scary thing to turn over the microphone to somebody for 25 minutes, uh, and uh, I can say anything. I can just, I can just say anything. And so, Pastor Dennis has trusted me, and I appreciate that trust. So, thank you. It means a lot to me. So, like, like uh, it was a good introduction. I'm a missionary. Just put that out there. I'm a missionary, and I love being a missionary. I love this adventure that God has put my family on. It's a good life. It's a hard life, but it's a good life. I had the privilege just a couple of weeks ago. I came back uh, with with my friend Renee. She was in Haiti with us, and I, I love taking people to Haiti. I love introducing them to the country. I love introducing them to the church. I love introducing them to the people. It's one of the joys that I get to have because I love Haiti. I love the country. It's a dynamic country. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful country. It has, it has art. It has music. It has incredible people. It has so much potential. But it's also one of the poorest countries in the world. It just is. 77% of the people who live in Haiti are living in poverty. 59% of the people who are living in Haiti are living on a dollar a day. That's barely surviving. That's just hanging on. The people in that situation, they don't have enough money to uh, send their kids to school. They don't have enough money to buy medicine when they're sick. They don't always have enough money to buy food. And so when something bad happens, when trouble comes, when, when like last year, when uh, last October, uh, a hurricane came, wipes out 80% of the crops in the country. That pushes people over the edge. Food prices double overnight. That pushes people over the edge. I love Haiti, but it's a hard place to live. It is a hard place to live. We have neighbors who only eat once a day. Sometimes they only eat every other day. And so they give up their children. They go to an orphanage and they turn over their children instead of watching them suffer. Our home base in Haiti is called One Family in Christ Jesus Foundation. It's, it's uh, my family, that's where my family lived for a year, that's where we go, that's where we, we launched our mission. And it's been our home, our second home ever since we left. And there isn't a week that goes by when my brother, Pastor Kesnell Joseph, where, where somebody doesn't come to him and say, please, Pastor, take my baby. Please, take my six-year-old. Please, take my ten-year-old because I can't feed them anymore. Our call, the focus of our mission, is to make that request more rare. We team up with our Haitian brothers and sisters who are already uh, on the ground, who are already being in the hands of feeding Jesus. And they're doing this in incredibly difficult circumstances. And so we do this, we, we partner up with them, and we do it in the most empowering way that we can. We, we do it in the most positive and sustainable, spirit-led way that we can. Because like Pastor Dennis said, we, we rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us in what to do next. We, we rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us he leads us in prayer, he leads us in books, he leads us in mentors that he has introduced us to, to refine our minds and our spirit. And the Holy Spirit has led us to miracles that give us hope. And he's shown us tragedy that breaks our hearts. Have you ever, have you ever uh, heard that song uh, by Hillsong, Hosanna? And there's that line in the song, where she sings, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. That's a missionary's prayer. That's a dangerous prayer. Don't sing those words to God and think that he's not going to take you up on that offer. Don't sing those words to God and think that he's not going to send you out into the heart of darkness with that broken heart. Because he will. Because he does. That's what it means to follow Jesus. 
sometimes he is going to send you out into the heart of darkness with that broken heart. But you will never walk into that alone. That's also what it means to follow Jesus. The Spirit has shown us over and over again that Jesus needs to be the center of what we do. And that we have to live out of that center. And that's what I want to talk about today. But I'm not going to preach to you. And I'm not going to teach. I just want to testify about what I've seen. Amen. The last time I was here, I talked about uh, the earthquake in Haiti. And I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again because I witnessed so many powerful stories from there. So I just, I just, I just need to visit it again. That quake happened on a Tuesday at 4.53 in the afternoon. In just a few seconds, in just a few seconds, everything fell apart. At 4.52, at 4.52, people were still at work. Kids were still at school. People were, they were traveling, or they were having dinner, or they were doing whatever it is that people do at the evening. And then everything changed at 4.52. Thousands and thousands of people died in just a few moments. And thousands and thousands more would die in the days to come. And when I arrived four days later, the air was filled with smoke and, and dust and the sounds of wailing. And people just wandered around, dazed. They were looking for help, or they were looking for food, or they were just looking for a place to lay down. And, and they got together and they started making tents out of sheets or plastic or whatever they could find. And they built them in parks, in, in, in open spaces, anything that was away from buildings. And very quickly, these turned into little cities. And, and people just started wandering in. Many of these people were children. Families were separated by the quake. Kids were at school, parents were at work, and then everything was chaotic. And there was no way to get in touch with anybody. Kids just wandered around, hurt and hungry and scared through a dark and dangerous city. Imagine that for a second. Imagine being a child wandering around in a pitch black city, alone, lost. For the, for the two weeks that I was in Haiti, I slept uh, in the parking lot of, a, of, a, of an orphanage outside of Puerto Prince, and that's where I met Pastor Moise Laval. Pastor Dennis, Pastor Dennis knows Pastor Moise. He's spoken at his church. Moise is the kind of person that I think of when I hear the word pastor. He's kind, he's gentle, he's a shepherd, he's relentless. Every morning after the quake, Pastor Moise, he would get up in the morning and he would go out into the neighborhoods of Port-au-Prince, into those tent cities, and he would, he would gather the lost children and he would walk through those tent cities with a bullhorn, calling out the names of the children that he had found. And sometimes their parents would come and sometimes a relative would come, but when the child was too hurt or when that child had no parent to come for them, he would take them home outside of Port-au-Prince to that orphanage. And every morning, Pastor Moise left early, and every night he came back late with more and more children. And that by itself is remarkable. A, a, a man going into a broken city to rescue the most vulnerable, lost children whose entire world had been upended. Children who are in serious danger. There was hunger, there was thirst, there was injury, there was illness. But that was not the most dangerous thing. A disaster brings out the best in people, but it also gives opportunity for evil. It was a dangerous place for a child to be. Pastor Moise rescued so many children from that faith. And that alone was remarkable. But the thing was, the world for him had collapsed too. On Tuesday, at 4.52, he was secure in his world. 
he was a pastor of a small church in the community that he had grown up in, in a city that he loves. He's a, a husband, a father. His son is safe at school. And the next minute, his church is gone. His community is in chaos. His city is in ruins. And that child who was safe in the school, that child's school came crashing down. Every morning, Moise went out into those cities with a broken heart. Every night, he came back with child after child, but none of them were his child. He didn't know if his son was hurt. He didn't know if he was trapped somewhere. He didn't know if he was dead. He didn't know if his son was wandering the streets somewhere alone, or it's still inside the rubble of that school. Can you imagine that kind of anxiety? Not knowing if your child's alive or dead? Can you imagine the heartache? But he kept going every day, relentless, a shepherd for God. And then one night, after a long day, I looked at Pastor Moses. And in my head, in my head, I asked him, how can you be doing this? How can you be here? How can you still be moving? I didn't say any of these so I couldn't get any of that out. All I said was, how? That's all I came out. And he said, I know of no other hope outside of the resurrection of Jesus. In 1919, at the end of World War I, the writer W.B. Yeats, he looked out on the aftermath of death and destruction in a world that had, had long forgotten God. And he wrote this line, things fall apart, the center does not hold. Horrible things happen. Uh, things that we were dreading, things that we never saw coming, they happen things fall apart. Our lives as we know, our lives that we dreamed that they were going to be, turn into something that we don't even recognize. And all we're left is crisis. We, we enter a bottleneck where we have to go through it. And the pain that comes with that, it can wreck us. When trouble comes, when real trouble comes, like, like betrayal and, and failure and injustice and divorce and sickness and loss, death. When those things come, it'll shake us to our core. And sometimes it shakes that core apart. And we're left with this, this despair. Like we're all alone. In it. Like, like God, he either he's not there or he doesn't care. So why bother? Why even go on? On the night before he died, Jesus, he got together with his friends. And he, during that meal, he laid out what was coming for everybody. What was coming for each of them. Trouble is coming, he said. He tells that one of them is going to betray him. And that he's going to suffer. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to be tortured. And all of his friends are going to run away. And Peter says, no, 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 not me. Not me. And Jesus says, yes, you. Yes, you. In fact, before this night is over, you're going to deny even knowing me three times. You're all, you're all going to be terrified. You're going to be terrified. You're going to scatter in that terror. And then he says, hold on to me. Hold on to me. Trouble is coming. You're going to suffer, but hold on to me. I'm like a vine. Be my branches. Get your strength from me. Hold on to me. Because trouble is coming. They're going to persecute you. And I know that you're scared. You have every right to be. They're coming for me, and you're going to run away. But just understand this. Just understand this. When you abandon me, I will not be alone. My Father is in me, and I am in Him. I am holding on to Him. I am holding on to Him. Hold on to me like I'm holding on to Him. Let my faith be your example. When crisis 
comes for us. We have no choice but to go through it, but we do begin to decide how we go through it. This is what Jesus was telling the disciples, and this is what he's telling to us right now. He's saying, hold on to me. Trouble is coming, and, and it's going to break your heart. And by heart, I'm not, he's not talking about this thing that's beating in your chest. And he's not talking about your emotions or your feelings. He's talking about your center. He's talking about your identity. He's talking about that thing that makes you do that place where you put all of your trust. He's talking about this very center. And Jesus is saying to all of us, make me your center. Make me your center. It doesn't protect us. From, from suffering. It doesn't protect us from pain, but He will carry us through it. That's the promise that He makes to us. So I'm standing there. I'm standing there in this orphanage in the middle of the night, and I'm looking at this broken-hearted man, and I'm asking him how. And he says to me, I know of no other hope outside of the resurrection of Jesus, and from any other person at any other time, I would have written that off as a churchy platitude. You know, and that's just something that people say. But from that man, from that man at that moment, I cried where I stood because I knew what he was talking about. He was in pain. He was in torment. He was living inside of the heart of darkness. But he was drawing strength from his center. And there was still work to be done. When I arrived, at that orphanage, there were 33, 33 children living there. When I left, there were 500 children living there. Every single one of them rescued by Pastor Moise. One of those children was James. Moise found James all alone in a collapsed building. He had been struck in the head by a uh, cinder block that had torn his, his skin open from his forehead in the middle of the eyebrow all the way back to his ear. It was a horrible wound. It was a terrible wound. I took care of James for two weeks. Every morning and every evening I took care of James. He was a tiny boy. He was this little boy. And he didn't speak except to say water and food. And all he wanted to do was to be held. And so I held him. And I talked to him. But he didn't talk back. He was inside this shell. And he did not come out of it. And as the time got nearer and nearer for me to go home, my anxiety about James got more and more. And so one morning I was praying to God. And I was like, God, can't you do something to help this child? And God came back to me and said, go fix him. And I didn't exactly think that was fair. I'm used to making a list for God. I'm used to making a list for God for him to take care of. And I'm saying, God, could you bless this child? He said, sounds like a good idea. Go bless this child. So I went to my friend Bill, who was, uh, was a doctor we had for two weeks. We've been putting together these impromptu uh, medical clinics and emergency rooms. So I said, Bill, isn't there something that we can do about James' face? So Bill looks at James, and he, if you know Bill Gossman, forgive me for the in impression of Bill Gossman, but he goes, yeah, yeah, we can do something, but you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me, and we're going to need something to knock the kid out. That's just how Bill talks. We're going to need something to knock the kid out. So we take, we take James, and we go to this, uh, this orphanage that's even further out from Port of France. It was uh, an orphanage in a, in a uh, slash nursing school. And we've been taking people there for, for the last couple of weeks. And it always just been a couple of nurses, uh, in, in, uh, nursing students. And they could do, like, they can set bones and they can uh, stabilize people with IVs. But in the previous days, all sorts of doctors and nurses from all over the world had gathered in this one parking lot to set up, like, this mobile mass unit, you know, emergency room thing. And so 
But we take James' place, and, and the, first, the first person in scrubs that we see, we just pull him aside, and we, and we, we say, we're looking for anesthesia, some anesthesia for this child. And the guy says, well, let me look at this child's face. And we, we unwrap James' face, and he looks, and he goes, oh my gosh. He was like, you know, I'm a, I'm a surgical resident. I can fix that. I, I want to I, I wanna work on this child's face. And, we'll, and Bill goes, Bill will be, oh God, thank you. Oh, if it, I, I only have this guy here. This kid was going to look like Frankenstein. I'm not, and I was, in my head, I was like, oh, thank God, this kid was going to look like Frankenstein. Uh, and so we were, we, were, we were thrilled. And as we're talking to this, to this surgical resident, another doctor comes up and is like, what's going on? And he's like, look. And we show him James. He goes, oh my gosh. You know, I'm, I'm a chief surgical resident at such and such hospital. And we're like, oh, that's even better. And then another person walks out, I'm not kidding. But then a second, another person walks out, oh, I'm the chief pediatric surgeon at such and such prestigious hospital. And in, in a matter of moments, we are, there are growing concentric circles of more and more qualified people, each one of them wanting to operate on this child's face. And finally, this other man comes up to him and says, what's going on here? And he looks at this child, oh my gosh. He's not, I'm not a doctor, I'm an administrator. He goes, but we have uh, pediatric plastic surgeons coming tomorrow from such and such prestigious hospital. I want this child to be the first child who gets work done. That child went from, from Bill and me operating on him in an orphanage broom closet to having a world-class team of surgeons fix his face. this moment. And it's a good story. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything that you were talking about before? Just give me a second. I had to leave. I had to leave. I had to come back to the United States before I found out what had happened to James. I didn't get to see how it turned out. And as happy as I was to be home, to be with my family again, I was anxious. I could not stop thinking about this child and what had happened to him. And so I contacted Pastor Maurice. I sent him a series of frantic texts. What's going on with him? Is he okay? And he sent me back this photo of this little boy standing in a silly pose with this thin scar on his forehead. And it kind of went from this horribly disfiguring scar to this kind of cool, Scar that, like, you know, when he gets a little bit older, the ladies are gonna think that just makes him look a little bit dangerous. You know, he, he goes to that. And, 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 and Pastor Moe says, more than that, more than that, when we took off this child's bandages, it was like he was coming out of his cocoon. He talks to everybody, he's like the mayor. A couple days after that, Nearly 20 days after the earthquake, Pastor Moise found his son's body under the rubble of that school and his wife, and he were finally able to mourn. And that Sunday, Moise gathered with his congregation under a tarp in the wreckage of their church, and they prayed, and they sang, and they worshipped, and then they baptized 40 people who had chosen to make Jesus their center. Amen. The next week, Moise woke up from a dream that God had given him. He got out of bed and he went to the orphanage. He found James. And he said, let's go take a ride. God has shown me something. And so they went to the neighborhood where he had found James. And he started showing him to people. Standing on the corner. Have you, did you know this child? No, 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 no. For an hour. No, no, no one saw him. Until the little girl says, I know him. That's James. His aunt is around the corner. And Moise goes, go, get that, that boy's aunt, please. And she came back around the corner with James' aunt and his grandmother and his mother. For 30 days, they thought that child was dead. At 30 days, they thought he was dead, and now he was in their arms. I 
don't know why. I don't know why one child dies and the other one comes back from the dead. I don't know. But I do know that God is good all the time. It doesn't always feel like that, but it's true. Our circumstances, our pain, our grief, our loss are not a reflection of God's love for us. Jesus is God's love for us. That's not a churchy platitude. That is the truest statement that I have ever made. And every one of us needs to decide who Jesus is going to be in our lives. Is he a belief? Is he a spiritual person you look up to? Or is he the center of your life? That decision makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in eternity. No matter, no matter what happens, no matter how much life unravels with Jesus as your center, whatever we lose, we are not alone. We are not alone. He is always with us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us the way you do, relentlessly. Be our strength, be our center. No matter the trouble, no matter the, the strength of our fear, no matter the depths of the darkness, be our center. Help us to live and love fearlessly, knowing we are yours and yours are and we are yours, ours. Hosanna in the highest, amen.